The scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Now therefore, revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served before the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you, Charles. Bishop Scott Jones, before he was a bishop, in fact, before he'd even actually taken his place in a church, he was with his adult Sunday school class. And he said, you know, next week I go to start preaching at my own church. What should I preach on? And they looked at him and they said, when you're a pastor, you need to preach on sin. You need to preach on murder. You need to preach on adultery. And he looked at them and said, well, how about if I preach on some of the sins that we're actually committing, like gossip and lying or, you know, breaking the speed limit on Highway 70? And I'm not quite sure that's a sin. If it is, I need some repenting. Uh, but he said that when it got up close and personal, the class got really quiet when it might be some things that they would be called into accountable for, accountability. But, you know, we have an up-close and we have a personal God, a God who offers all the grace and all the love that we've talked about over the last few weeks, those, those great resources and times of change, all the way to the God that, that pursues us. But now the invitation is to go a little deeper and see what place does God have in our life. It is season of back to school and new beginnings, so the question becomes... What has the place, the number one place in our life, what sits on the throne of our heart, if you want to put it that way? Oz Guinness said this a long time ago. He says, idolatry in the Bible is really huge. It is dominant in our personal lives and irrelevant in our mistaken estimations. So what he's saying there, idolatry is a big deal in the Bible. We have a lot of idols and we totally underestimate what that means in our life. See, it'd be really easy to point out, wouldn't it, if we had a big golden calf uh, in the middle of the backyard. It would be really easy if um, there was some kind of symbol of, a, of one of the gods with the little Gs that we bowed down to. But it, it is much harder to see when it's wrapped and does not come wrapped in religious vestments. But it, we are to look for everything that has elbowed out God. All the gods with a little g that have taken the place of God with a big g. The question becomes, what or whom do we worship? Kevin Eidelman is the author of Gods at War. It's an actual book we've been reading, and your, your staff all read it for staff retreat. And he brings us back to the bedrock of our faith. And he says, idolatry isn't just one of many sins. It is the sin from which everything else flows. If you start scratching at the struggles you have in your life, when you get to the bottom, you'll probably find that you're dealing with a false god or something that is taking God's place in your life. There are a hundred million symptoms, but the issue seems to always be idolatry. God said in the very first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. Now that kind of makes us think there's a hierarchy, okay? As long as God is at the front of the line, or as long as God is number one, but the actual language says, I don't want anything else that you worship even anywhere in my presence. Don't want it anywhere around me. The effort to dethrone those things that would want to get in line or even take the place of God is important so that we can experience the fullness of the joy of what it means to have an undivided heart and an undivided life. It becomes hard because almost everything that we put too much emphasis on, that we put, give too much attention to, that we become a little too attached 
you know, like I said, my cell phone, if I don't write, I know exactly where it is. And, you know, a whole other issue that it keeps me more company than most of my friends. You know, I mean, <laughs> there's just some issues there. But the real issue or the real problem is that none of those things are bad. Okay, God doesn't hate pleasure. God doesn't hate intimacy and sensuality. God does not hate success or power or our family units. It's what happens when they begin to possess us and we obsess over them and they get in the way of us putting our first attention and our best attention to the Lord. They become an end in themselves and they take the place of God on the throne in our hearts. You can think of some of the things, right? Maybe the most important thing in your life is making the team or getting the promotion or getting to go on the trip. Uh, maybe it's to keep your house absolutely spotless or to, um, I don't know, sometimes our church becomes uh, an idol as opposed to God's church, right? Uh, having something new and something wonderful. I paid my last car payment last week. And on the very day that my last car payment was due, I got a flashy, splashy email from Joe Mockins Ford telling me that I was now qualified to buy a new car with 0% financing for 72 months. That's where I bought it originally. So the day they knew I would be making my last car payment, I get information from them. Okay? There's a... Well, I'm just saying, you know, that's some wise marketing with those folks, but... You know, you could just get sucked in. And it's, if, if I thought, oh, man, I missed my convertible. I've missed my convertible for four years. So I deserve to have a convertible. But then you know what that would do? That, that could become an idolatry. So then where do I have the money to go on a mission trip? Or where do I have the money to be freed up to do other things? See, I'm talking about my own thing here, but you can figure out what it is. And it's not that anything, all those things are are neutral in morality. They're not moral or immoral. The problem comes is when they become corrupted and twisted and they, they begin to get their roots and their vines into our lives and pretty soon what looks like a cute little vine is kudzu and it has swallowed you alive and nothing kills it. Okay, if you've driven through the South. The scripture from Joshua this morning is an old, old story and it is new, as new as the Bob Dylan lyrics that say, you're gonna serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. And we may think that it is odd when he's talking about gods of the Amorites and all that. But if we pay attention, he's actually opening up four doors for the people. Door number one is to follow the gods from beyond the river, where you started out a long time ago before you ever ended up in Egypt. That's a choice. Door number two is to follow the gods of Egypt where you were enslaved. Door number three is there's an awful lot of local gods you can choose what you want from the people that are right here. And door number four would be to serve the Lord. Actually, those are tied to specific times and places that we could figure out in our own lives. They become a compass which chooses the way that we lead. The, the gods of, uh, shall we say, beyond the river before we ever get started, those could be the gods of, of our mothers, of our fathers. Now, there's nothing wrong with our mothers and fathers, right? But for the most part, if we find ourselves kind of paying attention or over attention to please them rather than God, well, my mother always kept a spotless house. I better keep a spotless house. Oh, my, my father, you know, there was, never, there was never a weekend when the car didn't get washed or whatever else. I mean, those are, those are simple examples of things. But we pick up some habits and we have to ask, okay, is this, is this a good habit? that helps me or is it something that begins to control my life and whatever I have learned from the past the most natural path in the world is to adopt some of the things of our parents then there are the gods of Egypt that's the places um, or the gods of our past the gods that never go away the little G's we come in different stages of life when we come to church when we come to even better to love Jesus and have a relationship we bring stuff with us you know, Joshua knew that they still had some of Egypt stuck on their sandals, so to speak. That's the way Idleman puts it. And, you know, there are some things that we've stepped in that still cling to the soles of our shoes, if not other soles. And the question is, do we still need them? How can God help us get rid of those? And then behind the next door, door number three, he says the gods of Egypt are the gods of culture. And that war is waged every single day. 
that we are to be of the world, but in the world, but not of it, that we are to not be conformed to the patterns of this world. J.B. Phillips paraphrased it this way, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Do not let the culture around you force you into its cookie cutter, its jello mold, its way of doing things. But there is a fourth choice, God alone. All the other options are mirage, our lies, our illusions masquerading as importance, but doing nothing to satisfy the hungers and the thirsts of life on a long-term basis. So it's back to basis, basics. Folks, we are preparing ourselves in the next three weeks for what you might call a, a spiritual arteriogram. We're going to ask some questions this morning. We're not going to get to any answers. I hope you leave feeling a little uncomfortable, a little bit here and there, because, because quite frankly, if Jesus doesn't disturb us once in a while, we're not paying attention, okay? That uh, is a good question. But here's some questions, and think of them as, as dye that's injected into your heart so we can see where our idols may lie. The first one is what disappoints you when we become bitterly disappointed are we seeing something that has taken too great a place the second is what do we complain about because what we whine and complain about shows what has power over us and we ask ourselves where do we make financial sacrifices follow the money if we want to follow our hearts. What worries us? Whatever keeps us up at night or wakes us up or hounds us in the day, perhaps it's because we haven't trusted God with what's going on. And the one that I found particularly interesting was, where do you find your sanctuary? Meaning, where, what do you turn to for emotional peace and security? It's also good to ask myself, for you to ask yourselves, for us to ask ourselves, what makes me really angry? And is it coming from a point of holy discontent? Or does it show that in my quick temper, it might be that I am worshiping the idol of me? And then our daydreams. We are to dream dreams and have visions, but where do our thoughts take us? Do they bring us closer to God and our family closer to the things that enrich us or do they take us down rabbit trails that eventually will run us over? When Joshua asked the people, who will you serve? They very gladly said, the Lord, the Lord. And he said, okay, but it's not a bumper sticker. It's not something you can get tattooed on your shoulder. It is not just something that you'll add to your words. But remember that God really wants all of you. And wants to be first in your life. And then all the blessings. Because we need to remember that the other gods... They're always circling. They're always looking for a place to become number one, and they never surrender. So let us stand guard, letting God examine us and reveal the roots in our own lives of the gods at war. Because we're going to serve somebody. We're going to serve somebody. The question that must be answered daily is, whom? Amen.